This reveals they have a culture and they have an amazing memory. Different populations of humbugs not only have a different dialect, they also have different habits. Habits for breeding, habits for migrating, habits for feeding. Just like Asians have different habits than Europeans or Caucasians or Latinos, same way. Same species, different populations, different habits, different cultures. Whales are no exception. And singing is an evidence of these different cultures around humpback whales. If we find males singing out there, we have microphones to listen to this, more likely to record this. If we can accurately find the male, visually, we'll be able to put the boat as close to him that you will need the aid of the speaker to listen to it. In the whale watching industry, that's very rare. In our case, if we can visually spot and locate the singer, I'll guarantee you, you can listen without the speaker. If we can't visually see the singer, it's very hard. We may do it, we may not, but every day we're getting better at it. It's been 16 years of locating singers out of 18 years of research. Well, moving a little bit on what uh, we've done research-wise, I've conducted three lines of research that will help us to do the sightings today. First one is the recognition of individuals. How do I identify humpback whales individually? Is by their tail markings. Have a unique ventral pigmentation, but we just use the ventral pigmentation of the tail. Before they dive deep, they show this portion of their body, and it's relatively easy to capture a picture and identify the individual. I build up a network, a well watching network, to expand the surveillance over these waters. Now we're 14 different photographers instead of two. Four different researchers, we are compiling this information, and we build a catalog for humpback whales on a yearly basis. Then we exchange this information with other networks in the higher latitudes, and we can track their migration routes, estimate their numbers, and estimate all the birthing rates, mortality rates, ecological dynamic parameters. And that allows us to understand what's happening with this population. After 18 years, I can tell you a few facts of this, uh, of this particular population. First, these are examples of the whale's tails. If you want to pass it around. Some are totally white, others are totally black. There's many patterns in between. And just to name a few, this white tail has a, some very interesting uh, scars on the right low. If you zoom in that pattern, it really looks like the Corona logo. So I named her Corona. Simple as that. Doesn't have to be complex. Has to be easy. For instance, the black, the black one in the further corner. It looks like the Batman logo. So I named this guy Batman for obvious reasons. Well, the guy in the upper corner from Batman, that's Radar. This whale was named by researchers in Mexico City as Geronimo due to the pigmentation of the Indian. Here we call it Radar. It's the same whale, it has the same catalog number. So, well, every time we see an animal, we can add a layer of information. For instance, Radar was first seen in these waters by the University of Mexico, by Paloma, in 1985. First time I spotted him was 1995 just for instance. And every time we see them, we can add more information in the site. Now we know Batman is a male, Radar is a male, Corona is a male, Corobon is a male, Salvatore is a female. We don't know who this guy is, a male or a female. So we get again to know according to their behavior or if we're able to pick if it's a male or it's a female. According to the behavior, you can also tell if it's a newborn with the mama, or a yearling just weaned, or a teenager, or a sexually mature adult, or a senior. Their lifespan is 70 to 80 years, but it's really not important the number of years a whale is, how old is it. The important thing is its role within the population, because they will all help each other to overcome climatic changes or changes in the environment and come back in numbers. Well, this population of humpbacks efficiently migrate from these waters of Mexico, from 
Tehuantepec and Nayarit area all the way to California through British Columbia. That's where they feed. And we're talking about 22 to 2400 humpback whales. They're coming back in numbers, 5% a year, at least the last six years we've been analyzing this new information. They're coming back in numbers, 5% a year. NOAA estimated a worldwide wor uh, comeback or growth of the humpback population, 3.1% a year. So yeah, in general, they're coming back in numbers. In particular, these populations of the Pacific are coming back slowly, yes, because there's enough energy in the north to support this growth, and there's not in a genetic variability among each of these populations to come back in numbers as a healthy population. And there's different ingredients why this happens. Well, is a support, is a well protection, there's no whaling, but there is a natural mortality of babies. 25 to 30 percent of their babies that are born here are killed by orcas or killer whales. And I used to cry over this fact. But however, the transient group of orcas that come in these waters to hunt babies are looking for babies that can dive deeper or that they are clumsy, they've grown slow. The weaker babies, they're easier to hunt. So in the big play, the role of the orcas is to remove the weaker genes before they're passed on to the next generation. So that's another important ingredient that allows this population to grow the strong genetic variability. So it's amazing how all connects to make this happen. And while Banderas Bay is no surprise, we have a wide variety of cetaceans, orcas, false killer whales, pygmy killer whales, bottlenose dolphins, spotted dolphins, spinners, rough tooth. There's others not in this chart, sperm whales, big whales, cyphids. Occasionally, very rare, we see gray whales. But every single year, we see two species of baleen whales. Not only the humbug whale comes to this area for breeding, but Brutus whales comes for breeding and feeding. These species does feed in these waters where they're the humbug doesn't. And uh, you, you want to check it on the chart. It's very slick. It looks like a blue whale in Atkins diet. <laughs> it really does. And I have a picture of her on the back. So you can see how it looks. Right, they do. How they really look slick. They're skittish, but they're beautiful. And you can find that species in these waters, particularly abundant in spring months or late winter. Right now is a good time. Or also late fall. November, perfect time to see Brutus whales. I've seen them in April, July, October, every single month of the year. And this is the appearance. It has a falcate dorsal fin at the far end. A flat head, and they show the dorsal all the way to the head at the same time. Humpbacks usually, the dorsal fin is further on the middle. And well, here I put another picture of how whales feed, so you can appreciate the baleen. That's a yearling feeding on a shoulder of sardine. So you can see how they filter out the water through the baleen and use this structure efficiently to filter feed large amounts in a short time. Well. These both species are from the Rorqual family. They both have throat groups, like I mentioned before. And the Rorquals are my favorite of all baleen whales. You're talking about the largest of the, all animals ever lived on Earth. That's a blue whale. A finback, the fastest of them all. The say whale, the Brutus whale, which is tropical, stays within the tropical ranges. Humpback whale and minke whales. These, they all have these throat groups. Between the throat groups, when they expand eating, you see a reddish coloration, reddish pigmentation. That's what the word rorqo means. Rorval in Norwegian means red whale, from this coloration. So sometimes the undersides in the tails or a little bit on the flippers, especially on the belly, reveal a pinkish coloration. So maybe we'll see that too. It depends on the behaviors. I cannot guarantee what behaviors we're going to see today or how long the whales are going to be diving for, but I'll guarantee we'll give you the best possible sightings. And possible sightings we could see today, there's mothers and babies, newborns from this season, 13 so far. We've seen uh, several yearlings, actually 12 yearlings this season, that were born last year. They returned with mama after one year of nursing and they just win, and Mama is just taking a sabbatical year this year. 
next year that mama after another good feeding season that restores her organs and the energy will come back here and she will be receptive but she's in a sabbatical a lot of males always hopeful sexual mature guys always hopeful younger wines speaking and learning a lot of these males swim in pairs along the area or gathering four or fives as singing and moving while singing scanning the bay looking for other whales males and receptive females of course we can find solitary male singing or we can find a senior or females on a sabbatical escorting a mother we call that a nurse whale when it's a male escorting we call that an escort in these waters there's more males than females Actually, this population holds 60% males, 40% females. So you can imagine that competition for mating is very high, since only the third of the sexually mature ones will be available and receptive. So these guys have to put up a big work, big display out there. If we find a group of males following a female, either in a competitive group or courting group or a mating group, you will see what we call a testosterone driven behavior of a humpback. It's amazing what these guys do. So, let's explore the area. Let's see what we can find. We'll be describing the behavior. And if we find an animal we can recognize from its tail, we can tell you a story about this humpback whale. <coughs>